Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Velhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil hılkı ecma'in. Muhammedi ve ehli beytihi tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahümme salli ala Muhammedi ve ali Muhammed. The subject of fiqh and we are on the first issue of taklid. Here in taklid and in other parts of fiqh there are words used we have to know their definition the word wajib or mustahab mubah makruh and haram uh, these are called al ahkamul khamsa or some add to it aqud and iqaat and become seven al ahkamul sab'a so it's better to know their definition in advance before we start Wajib or usually translated obligatory or necessary in English. When you say it is necessary, means what? Means any act ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is a reward for doing it and punishment for not doing it. So it is a must should be done because there is punishment for not doing it. Mustahab generally translated as recommended it is any act ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there is reward for doing it but there is no punishment for not doing it mubah well sometimes translated in neutral neutral means is neither obligatory nor haram prohibited so it is a neutral it is any act that there is neither reward for doing it nor a punishment. Like a drinking cup of water, there is neither reward in it nor punishment. Makruh means not recommended. Any act negated by Allah and there is reward for not doing it, but there is no punishment for doing it. There are many makruhat like they say drinking water at night while standing is makruh at night is better to sit and drink water it is makruh so if you do not do it intentionally you will be rewarded but if you do it there is no punishment haram or translated generally as prohibited any act negated by Allah and there is punishment for doing it the six called aqood, the contracts. Contracts is like contract of marriage, contract of business, for buying, selling, all these are contracts. These are one of the seven decrees. Iqa'at is a one-sided obligation. Somebody, he make it obligatory on his own self, you know, from his side. A contract is between two, two sides. Iqa'i from one side, like having an oath, nazar. I make oath that if God cured my son, I pay so much money for uh, poor people. So I put it from one side, an obligation on myself is called Iqa'at. So these are generally the seven decrees or say ahkamu sab'a, seven issues to know the meaning of that. Well, uh, it is not men mentioned here the details at the beginning of signs of a puberty. Uh, it is said for every baler, every uh, adult, it is wajib upon him then the, for one to be at age of a puberty according to Sharia. Ah. For boys, there are three signs. One sign, if the boy completed 15 lunar years, not solar years, naturally 15 lunar years will be about six months less than 15 solar years. So it is 15 lunar years. If he finish, then he become at age of puberty. Or growing of pubic hair, and that might happen sometimes at age of 12 or 13. Uh, it is... Uh, hair growing uh, black and that is sign of puberty third getting ejaculation by dreams which is called wet dreams 
For girls, there is only one sign, and that is completion of nine, again, lunar years, not solar years. So one has to be careful because that is less about four months less than the solar years. You have a question? Yes. Yes. Okay, we are not discussing the philosophy of that here, you know. We are discussing the issues said by the Maraja. Maybe at the end of the class we can discuss that in detail. This comes, of course, from Hadith. The ulama, when the Maraja say it, as we discussed yesterday, the process of ishtihad, the maraja depends on the Quran and the Sunnah and Aql and Ijma, and from that they reach the process of ijtihad and they uh, deduce the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, from the ahadith available. Some ahadith may, as we discussed yesterday, maybe looks contradictory, then the maraja has to solve that contradiction and say sometimes there are many rules and regulations in the subject usul al-fiqh, the principles of faith. Uh, they say there is aam and khas. One hadith sometimes they speak on general and another hadith speak on particular. So there is no contradiction. But the looking is from one side, not from a total way. And um, a hadith uh, sometimes the meaning in the situation might be different. So in that environment, uh, it has a different meaning, and so on. So that depends on a process of ishtihad. So the maraja, if they say it, because they have, of course, a hadith from the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, alayhim, which mentions that time. When they ask Imam Sadr, when the girl becomes at age of puberty, baligha, Imam said, when she finished nine lunar years. So it's a clear hadith, and if it is correct hadith, then the maraja depends on that hadith. So these are the fatwa of the maraja is depending on a hadith. Now, if there are some other hadith which shows more than that, maybe at the age of 11 or 12, etc., again, some will accept that, some will not accept that, some said uh, details are there, so we, we have to refer to the fatwa of the merger. See what the merger says. What is his view? Because as we said, we explained it in the last session that we are supposed to follow the senior most merger, senior most mushtahid. If the senior most views nine years, which is the usual and common view, then it is nine years, and that is according to his ijtihad and to so many hadith he has read and he understood, and they are a correct hadith. Well, if there are other reviews, naturally it must depend. Not, it is not I think or you think. It is what a hadith says. So we have to refer to a hadith or say this hadith. Anyhow, we leave the questions after the session. Now we come to uh, the first issue in uh, the book, Tawdih uh, al-Masail. It said, it is necessary for a Muslim to believe in the fundamentals of faith with his own insight and understanding. And he cannot follow anyone in this respect. That is to say, he cannot accept the word of another who knows simply because he had said it. Here we say, on the principles of faith, there is no taqlid, no following of people. Principles of faith we have to be convinced ourselves and we have to have our own proof. That is why we say we have to study the principles of faith in detail so that we are convinced that Almighty God is one, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the right Prophet, uh, Imams of Ahlul Bayt are the right Imams, there is the Day of Judgment, all that. We have to prove it ourselves. 
it is not sufficient to refer it to somebody. Say, okay, somebody, maybe a parent or a friend or colleague, he said God is one, I say one. If he say God are three, I say three. No, that is not the right way. However, one who has faith in the true tenets of Islam and manifests it by his deeds is a Muslim and Mu'min, even if he is not very profound and the laws related to a Muslim will hold good for him. Now here a question arise. So this is answer for a question may arise. There are many Muslims who do not know the proof of principles of Islam. What should we consider them as Muslim or not Muslim? Because you said it is necessary at the beginning. Necessary to know the principles of faith by proof. Now if some Muslim believes in the true tenets of Islam, not in the wrong way, in the right Islam, but his proof is shallow, not very strong, not very profound. Is he regarded as Muslim or not? The answer, yes, he is a Muslim because practically he is following the true tenets of Islam. So in, in Islam, on Usul al-Din, we have to prove them for ourselves and follow them with, as we say, delil, with the proof and convince ourselves. And naturally, if our knowledge of Tawheed and Adil and Nubuwat and Imamat and Ma'at, Prince of Faith, is higher and better, our position in Akhirat will be higher and our reward will be higher because the position in Akhirat is according to our knowledge and deeds. So if we have better knowledge, our position will be higher. Knowledge of the prophets is higher. That is why their position is higher and so on. Sometimes we believe Tawheed is only God is one simply Okay, that is one level of understanding. Sometimes we go into details like Imam Ali explained it in Najul Balagha, so that is a much better way of understanding of Tawheed. So if we study it more and better, of course we have a higher position in Akhirat, inshallah. So that is about the principles of faith. Now we come to the practices. Here at the end, uh, it said, in matters of religious laws, apart from the ones clearly defined or ones which are indisputable, a person must be either a mujtahid or if he is not a mujtahid, uh, should follow one or neither mujtahid nor a follower is muqallid. Now, here it needs little explanation. You see, in matter of religious laws, and that is the practical laws, in all of them or some of them. He put at the beginning an exception, you see. He said, apart from the ones clearly defined. Now, we know in Islam, prayer is wajib. Fast is wajib. Going for hajj is wajib. On this issue that going for hajj pilgrimage is wajib, do I need to do taqlid to follow a marja? They said, no, you may not need that because that is very clear. We follow on something which is not clear. If I go for Hajj, what are the practices of Hajj? I don't know those details. Then I need taqlid to follow a mujtahid on those. But on necessity of Hajj in Islam, because it is clear, say for clear things, uh, there is no taqlid. Or the other exception he put, or ones which are indisputable. Morning prayer is two rakats. Dhuhr prayer is four rakat. Maghrib prayer is three rakat. Do I need to do taqlid on these? Only this issue, not how to pray. Only taqlid, morning prayer is two rakat. They said no, not necessary, because there is no dispute about it. To say, okay, some said two, some said three, some said five. I don't know. No, there is no difference. Unanimously, all the ulama, all the Muslims, they said, morning prayer is two rak'at, dhuhr, four rak'at, maghrib, three rak'at. So on those who are clear and those who are indisputable, 
we do not need to follow a mujtahid, to do taqlid. Other than those which usually 99.9% .9 of the issues are not very clear and not indisputable. So in other issues, here we need three possibilities, he put. Either be a mujtahid, a mujtahid or is a jurist. Well, this simple translation. The jurist is the competent alim, competent enough to deduce precise inferences regarding the commandments from the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Holy Prophet and Ahlul Bayt by the process of ijtihad. You see, a mujtahid, as we explained yesterday, the one who studied the Arabic language, studied fiqh, studied principles of fiqh, studied hadith, and studied narrators of hadith, and studied uh, all subjects related to that, and he spent enough time, and now on each issue of Islam, he has certain hadith, and he know he can differentiate which hadith is right, which hadith is not right, which hadith is pointing on particular issue, which hadith is talking on general issue, khas and am and so on. And he can deduce the religious law from that. That is the, called the process of ijtihad and the person called mujtahid, a jurist. His a view is accepted. So either a person, I mean, he talk about general Muslims, you know, Either the Muslims are a mujtahid, capable of inferring and deducing from the religious sources and evidence. So if he is a mujtahid, naturally he will follow his own view, because he is specialized himself, and he follows his own view. If I give example of a doctor, if somebody is a student in medical college, he cannot follow his view, because he is not yet capable of diagnosing the disease and prescribing the treatment. But if he become a doctor, now he can follow his own view. He has his own view, he can diagnose the diseases and he can prescribe medicine. So that is a mushtad when he reach a stage that he can diagnose what is halal, what is haram. And we say it sometimes at the beginning mushtad is the partial mushtad, not on all issues is mushtad. Maybe he's capable of some of the issues to do ishtihad, but then by time, through studying years after year, by time he become what you call a total uh, mujtahid, means mujtahid in all Islamic issues and in all subjects of fiqh. So that is a mujtahid, means the mujtahid will follow his own view. He's allowed because his view is valuable. He knows the hadith, he knows how to compare between them, what to understand the meaning of them, and so on. The second possibility said, or if he is not a mujtahid himself, which usually 99.99% .99 of the people are not a mujtahid. Maybe in, let us say, Shia world, there is 500 or maximum, let us say, 1,000 mujtahid out of 250 million population, so 1,000 percentage out of 250 is very small. No? So the rest of the people are not a mujtahid. So he say he should follow one. He should. not. It is not optional. It is a must. That is to say he should act according to the verdict. Verdict means fatwa of a mujtahid. So the Muslim general, if they are not a mujtahid themselves, they should refer to a mujtahid and follow him on Islamic issues. Is there a third way if I don't want to do taqlid and I am not a mujtahid? Is there a third way possible? He mentions yes. The third way is called ihtiyat. He said if he is neither a mujtahid, nor a follower or muqallid. He should act on such precaution which should assume him that he has 
fulfilled his religious obligation. Now, some people, they have enough knowledge of uh, fatwa of the maraja. They study the different fatwas and different issues, but they themselves have not reached the state of ishtihad. They are not a mushtahid, but they know the differences of fatwa between maraja. If he do not want to do taqlid of a marja, what he will act, he will act on a precaution. Precaution means what? If marja said it is obligatory to perform this, and another marja on that issue said, no, it is not obligatory, it is recommended. So if he does that, practice that, he covered both the views. If it is obligatory, he did it. If it is recommended, okay, he got reward. It was not obligatory. So he covered both of you. So if he should act in such a way that he can cover both of you and to be on a safe side. If some marja said it is haram to eat that type of food, for example. Another one said, no, it is makro, not haram, not recommended. So for him, it become haram in order to cover both the views. Maybe for a muqallid who follow the marja, if his marja said it is makro, they can, he can eat because it is makro, not haram. But the one who work on ihtiyat, on a precaution, it will be haram for him because he has to cover both the views. Again, sometimes he has to do the religious deeds twice. Suppose one of the maraja say on this situation, if you are traveling, you have to pray qasr. Another maraja said, no, in this situation, your taklif is to pray full. Now, if he travel, he has to pray twice. He should pray full and then pray qasr in order to cover both the views because he working on Ihtiyat. If one of the maraja said alcohol is najis, another said it is tahir, so for him alcohol is najis because he has to work on precaution, ihtiyat. And so on. If a marja say ahlul kitab are najis, another marja say ahlul kitab are tahir, so he should regard ahlul kitab as najis because he has to work on precaution. Uh, well, in rare cases, that precaution is not possible because one say obligatory, the second one say haram. It's very rare examples. And the, well, that is rare. Anyhow, the one who work on ihtiyat has to know how to handle such cases. So generally speaking, those people who work on ihtiyat, I don't think there is also a thousand person who do ihtiyat because the people either reach a state of a mujtahid, follow their own view, or it is easier for them to do taqlid and uh, finish the matter because ihtiyat is not that easy. So uh, uh, we go back that uh, other than a few people who are maybe a thousand, two thousand, who are either a mujtahid or muhtat, the rest of the uh, believers, they should follow a mujtahid or do taqlid of the mujtahid. Now, uh, it is important here to explain the meaning of the word of taqlid. Taqlid simply we say following of a mujtahid. From where it has come the word? The word taqlid in Arabic from qallade. Qallade in language has two meanings. One is to put on the neck of someone, like you put a necklace, he said, Qallada al-qilada, qilada necklace. And in this meaning, we are putting our deeds on the neck of the mujtahid. In the sense, in the day of judgment, if Almighty God asks us, why you, uh, for example, uh, regarded alcohol as tahir, while it is najis, I say, oh my God, the mujtahid told me it is tahir. So I put it on his neck, on his shoulder, let us say. He is responsible, not me, because he told me, Allah says, it is tahir through the delil he has according to his ishtihad. 
It is not my view. It is a view of the specialist who is a mushtahid. So that is, we are putting our deed on his neck. That is one of the meaning of qallad. Other meaning, taqlid is following, like imitation, or to follow on footstep of someone. So again, here on the day of judgment, we say, oh my God, I have followed the one who is a specialist so that he will guide me to the right path. So I did taqlid of him. So that is the, literally from the language, Arabic language, meaning of taqlid. It has these two meanings. Now what does taqlid means in fiqh? Because as a term, fiqhi term, it has a different meaning. This will come in issue number two. Issued to taqlid in religious laws means acting according to the verdict of a mushtahid. So here the definition is acting according to the verdict of a mushtahid. Again here there are two definitions. This view is according to Ayatollah Sistani. Acting according to the verdict of a mushtahid. Another view is deciding only personal decision to follow a mushtahid or intention to follow a mushtahid is called taqlid. Then what is the difference in practical applications? The difference comes here. Now if a mushtahid you follow died, the marja died, then you have to do taqlid of a new mushtahid. A new mushtahid, if he says, on matters you did taqlid of the previous one, you remain on taqlid of the previous one. Now, what matters I did taqlid? If taqlid to practice, practice according to the verdict of the mushtahid, there are a lot of things I did not practice because I did not need them. Maybe I did not go for Hajj. So on issues of Hajj, I did not practice according to fatwa of my marja. I acted according to fatwa of my marja on issues of a prayer, for example. Issues of fasting, because I fasted in Ramadan month. But I did not have money to pay homes. So on issues of homes, I did not follow him. Did not practice according to him. So because meaning of taqlid is a practice, it shows that I did not do taqlid of that marja. So you see? But if the definition that it is the intention to follow a mushrik, if I asked those who know, and that the detail will come in the issue number three, I asked the specialist of two adil, and who is the a'lam? And they said, Mr. So-and-so is the senior most, is a'lam and decided from today, I am following this marja, suppose Ayatollah Sistani. So that intention, I say from today, I did taqlid. Even I have not practiced, I have not even offered two rak'at prayer according to his fatwa, but I am regarded as his follower, his muqallid, because I have intention and decision to follow him. That intention is sufficient. So it is a niyya, only if you have the intention to practice according to the verdict of a mushtahid, you did taqlid of him. So that is the second definition. But here Atullah Sistani used to practice, practice, you do, you pray, you fast according to the verdict of a mushtahid. So here there are, as I said, two views we should know because these views are important uh, when uh, the uh, marja dies and then we differentiate did we do taqlid of the previous one or not. These details will come on uh, some other issues will be elaborated. Uh, its practical implications will be elaborated more. Okay. Now we come to another subject. What are the attributes of a mujtahid we are supposed to follow. 
we said we are not a mushtahid and we are not practicing on a precaution. So we have to do taqlid of a mushtahid. Now, what are attributes of that mushtahid to do taqlid of him? Any mushtahid, we do taqlid of him. If that mushtahid is fasir, it's okay to do taqlid of him. If he is not religious, we can do taqlid of him. If he is not a Muslim, we can do taqlid of him. Suppose a Christian studied fiqh and become a mushtahid in Islamic fiqh. We can do taqlid of him. So there must be an attributes for that, you know. So here, he said the attributes of, of the mushtahid. It is necessary for the mushtahid who is followed to be male. I mean, in taqlid, we cannot do taqlid of the female. To be Shia Ethna Ashari, and if he is not a Shia, who believe in 12 Imams, we cannot do taqlid of him. Well, these are, of course, the conditions are, there are ahadith which mention that the marja depends on those ahadith, but its uh, philosophy is very clear because if he is not a Shia, he may give fatwa according to his own views, his own sect will not give fatwa according to Ahlul Bayt. So he has to be Shia and believe in 12 Imams so that he give fatwa according to Ahlul Bayt. And to be adult, well, it is very rare that a child become a mushtahid, but it is mentioned in history that Alam al-Halli was a mushtahid when he was at age of 12 years, probably he was not an adult at that time. So if by chance somebody become a mushtahid at a very young age, still he's a mushtahid for himself, but we are not allowed to do taqlid of him naturally because he is not a responsible person because haram and halal for him is not yet written so we cannot follow him so he has to be adult to be sane naturally if he is insane we cannot depend on his views and to be of legitimate birth if somebody is of illegitimate birth even if he becomes a mushtahid we cannot do taqlid of him. Has to be of legitimate birth. To be living means to start taqlid. We cannot start taqlid of somebody who is dead. We should start taqlid of somebody who is living. However, we may remain on taqlid of the dead marja by permission of a living marja. That details will come. So to be living. And to be just or adil. If he is not just, we cannot do taqlid of him. Now the meaning of justice and details of it, again, will come in another issue. But simply we say that he has to be just. Now, here is explaining the meaning of justice. Still, we are on issue number two. A person is said to be just when he performs all those acts which are obligatory upon him and refrains from all those things which are forbidden to him. Now, who is just? He said the just person if he fulfill his religious duties, whatever obligatory as prayer, fast, paying homes, zakat, going hajj, jihad, etc., amr al-ma'ruf, an al-munkar, all those duties he perform and he is called just and if he abstain from doing anything which is haram. That is one definition. However, according to some other ulama, they said this is not sufficient because he has to have malaki of not indulging in haram usually. Now again, they said malaki and usually. What does that mean? That means it's not that only he is fulfilling his religious duties and abstaining from haram. No, he should have that special psychological power 
it's called malake, it's a special ability to control himself. Now, if somebody is not doing haram, but very easily can maybe mislead and do the haram, and later on say astaghfirullah, and again easily mislead. Today he is not doing haram, but his faith is weak. He can be misled easily by others. He can do haram easily by others, by influence of others. So he said, though he is not disobedient today, but he does not have that control for himself. What's well, called malake, that special ability is not there. So some said definition of adil should have that psychological or personal ability to control himself, not to indulge haram or not to uh, leave any uh, obligatory act. And they said, غالباً, because he is not infallible, just and infallible are different. You see, usually not. But sometimes, suppose somebody is just got angry and said something, insulted his bro mu'min brother, or by mistake he did backbiting. But right away after, let us say, half an hour, five minutes, ten minutes, then he come to himself, oh, why did I did that? Why I was angry and insulted my mu'min brother? It is haram to insult people. Why I mentioned ill of my brother? It is haram to backbite. So right away he repent to Allah. Of course, at that moment, when he is sinful, he is not adil. But you see, he, he repents right away. That is why I say ghaliban, usually. He, he, he has the ability to control himself, usually. If always, then become masum, become infallible. But you see, usually, and in case he do anything haram, he repents right away. But if he every day he do haram and repent, this means he is not having malik of adalat. Every time, every hour, he backbite and he says astaghfirullah. And he backbite and he says astaghfirullah. So then you are not adil because you cannot control yourself. Okay, sometimes once in a while, one do a mistake possible, but always to repeat the mistake and say astaghfirullah. So it means you cannot control yourself. So it's not adil. So according to the, that definition, I mean some other ulama, they put that definition, it is malaka, it is an ability. Uh, then, of course, it is a higher position that um, those who only uh, fulfill their religious duties and abstain from haram, but do not have that control. Uh, however, according to Atullah Sistani that is mentioned, so, I mean, if somebody, let us say, if he's Imam of Jama'at, and you know, usually he is fulfilling his religious duties, and at the time of Jama'at prayer, he says, Astaghfirullah, Rabbi wa Atubu ilayhi, repent from any sin he has, you can say, for example, at that moment he is Adil. But according to other ulama, I said, no, that is not sufficient unless he has, as we said, Malaka of Adal, that ability to control himself. Otherwise, if he cannot control, we do not say he is fasir, he is not sinful, but he is not adil as well. There is a stage in between. He is neither adil nor fasir, nor sinful. Not sinful because he is not doing sin, but again, he does not have that control of adal. Okay, here come a question. How do I know a person is adil or not? What is the sign of Adalat? Of course, now, today, in front of me, of course, I don't see him, God forbid, drinking wine, for example, or indulging in haram, and I see him offering a prayer. But I don't know his practice at home or in the, his office and shop, what he is doing. So how do I know someone is Adil or not Adil? Here, uh, mentioned, about it, <clears throat> and the sign of being just is that one is apparently of a good character, so that if inquiries are made about him 
from the people of his locality or from his neighbors or from those persons with whom he lives, they would confirm his good conduct. And if one knows that the verdict of the mushtahid, that is another issue. So here, he mentioned that if we inquire about him from those who are working with him in the office, everybody said, no, he is a very good man, very honest, very sincere, religious. Or his neighbors in an area locality, we asked his neighbors, how is your neighbor? He said, well, he's a very good man, very honest, very sincere. He come pray in the mosque and he is very strict about religion. We have not seen him doing any haram. Or his friends, his colleagues, if we ask his colleagues, what do you say about your colleague? They said, well, this colleague is very good. Always he is strict about his religious duties. He never do haram and never indulge in a wrong thing. So we trust him. So that shows that he is adil. You know, that is the sign of adalat. So it is the sign of adalat. If, if I know him, I don't need to ask. If he is my friend, my colleague, and I know him, I don't need to ask. But if I come to a mosque and see somebody offering a prayer, and there are 50 people praying behind him, and I don't know he's adil or not, and ask the people who knows him, well, do you know this alim? They said, yeah, we know him. For so many years, he's our alim, and we know him. He's honest, he's sincere, he's adil. So that is a sign of adalat, that he's adil, and I can pray behind him. So the sign of adalat, that if we inquire from the people who knows him in his work or in his neighbors or his colleagues, they said he is a good man, honest man, sincere man, and not indulging in harm. So that is another point. In this issue too, there are so many points, actually they put in one issue, but if you go in books which mention details of fiqh, actually they are divided into more and more issues, but here he put so many points in one issue. And if one knows, you see, till now he did not discuss about A'lam, senior most. If you remember, he gave the uh, signs of the mushti to be followed. He said, male, shi'ath na'ashari, adult, sane, of legitimate birth, living and just. He did not say he should be A'lam, senior most. Because that point is explained here. And he said, and if one knows that the verdicts of the mujtahids differ with regard to the problems which we face in everyday life, it is necessary that the mujtahid who is followed to be a'lam, the most learned, who is more capable of understanding the divine laws than anyone of the contemporary mushtahids. Why he put it at the end? Because if in one issue all the mushtahids say the same thing, then it makes no difference to follow the senior most or the junior, because it is the same. All of them have the same fatwa. The drinking wine is haram. All of them say it is the same thing. So if I follow this one or that one, it is the same. But if there is a difference in a view between the senior most and the junior mujtahid. So here I am supposed to follow the senior most. And it said it is necessary. So it is wajib to follow the senior most or the most learned as is translated sometimes the a'lam. Because the a'lam as he explained at the end A'lam means what, what is definition of A'lam? How one is telling most? You see the one, he mentioned it. I read it again. Who is more capable of understanding the divine laws more than any of the contemporary mushtahids in his time? So there are many mushtahids, but 
one of them has more ability to deduce the divine law from Quran and Sunnah and uh, other sources. So he is called A'lam. And that is the definition of, of A'lam. Sometimes said he has Ihata, has wider knowledge on different subjects of fiqh. Well, you see why they put these definitions? Because sometimes it's difficult to say who is A'lam. Hell, knowledge is not uh, something material to weigh it. You say, okay, this is 10 grams and that is 11 grams. Okay, 11 is heavier than 10. You cannot weigh the knowledge, you know. But so how can you definish it? This is alam or that is alam? Which one is alam? Uh, so here, they said that the meaning of alam means his knowledge on religious issues, on sharia, is wider than others. And he has better understanding. Sometimes they say, shammul faqaha, his a smell of fiqh is better than others. He can understand the traditions better way. He can explain them in a better way. He can uh, join others and then deduce the view stronger than others. When he talk, his evidences are more clear than others. He can convince others with a clear cut evidence. So on many ways is mentioned and here uh, said his understanding, he put it in short, his understanding, which covers all these points, is more than the others. So if we know somebody who is alam, then it is necessary to follow him. Uh, how to know the alam? There are ways which come on issue three, and that is, inshallah, in the next session. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammad wa alihi tahirin. اللهم صل على محمد وعلي محمد